Govinda, yours has been a very, very fascinating journey from Detroit and the R&D center at GM to, you know, driving the entire product lineup for which transformed Mahindra. So, so there are many, many milestones really in the journey. But if you were to identify two, three turning points in your own career, which really helped you get here, what would they be? Well, uh, uh, clearly the, the most important decision that my wife and I made was to come back to India way back in 93. Uh, there was a turning point because uh, it's a very difficult decision. It was not fashionable at that time uh, for people who have lived in U.S. for so long to return back uh, back home. And having lived there for 18 years, for me to uh, decide along with my wife, in fact, she was the driving force behind it. Uh, it was not me. I didn't want to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, she was the driving force. And uh, and uh, to come back was, it was a difficult decision. And uh, let me also say very uh, honestly that... Uh, at that time, the pay structure for professionals uh, was nowhere near what it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, uh, even the, the earning uh, was, was, was tough, not just coming back uh, to India, but earning. But uh, we took that decision, headed of course by uh, the fact that uh, Mahindra uh, showed me what might happen here in terms of uh, uh, aspiration that any R&D professional would have in making a difference uh, in, in, in uh, technology, in product offerings and so on. And that was a very attractive uh, uh, sort of value proposition for me to come back and try and make a difference uh, uh, to a great company that we are here in Mahindra. Mm. And that's what it came. That was, that was one turning point. Uh, the second turning point for me was uh, clearly uh, completing Scorpio uh, and uh, seeing a very successful launch of Scorpio. Uh, which is what then led uh, for me to move away from technical uh, responsibility to more business management responsibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, in a way, was a completely new uh, sort of career for me. Uh, so in some sense, I have had three distinct careers. One in uh, a GM, purely in technology area. Uh, second in Mahindra, in product development, engineering area. And third in Mahindra as general management and uh, business responsibility area. So these are the two turning points. Mm -hmm. What was it like uh, to come back to Nasik from Detroit? Detroit is the center of the automobile industry, the center of R&D, iconic in that sense. It used to be even bigger than what it is now. So what was the difference that you saw at that time? Well, let, let me say that uh, I'm generally uh, perceived to be a left brain person. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, the decision to come back to India and join Mahindra in Nasik was a purely right brain decision where I did not go through a deep analysis of spreadsheet of what is left, what is right, what is wrong, pluses and minuses. I just said, I'm coming. I had not even seen Nasik. Yeah. I didn't know what Nasik was like. Uh, and when I landed in Nasik uh, and uh, went to work the first day um, and looked at this building where I was taken to, uh, so I said, where is R&D? So I said, they said, this is R&D. I said, this is it? <laughs> And I said, oh my gosh, what have I done? Have I done yeah. something wrong? Yeah. How can R&D happen in a in, in two-story, uh, 2,000 square feet uh, building uh, like what we have here? Uh, so, so it was a shock. It was a shock. But at the same time, it also was a challenge uh, that uh, was given at that time that can we take this R&D and someday create what we have today as MRV, uh, which is over 75 acres of, uh, of land with 2,500 people working. So that's the the professional uh, attraction uh, that uh, that was there for me to come into that setup which was uh, very rudimentary in terms of comparing R&D to any developed uh, international automotive company uh, to, to what we had at that time and now what we have today. Scorpio was an Indian uh, product and, and it's been one of the most successful products for Mahindra. Tell me, what is the challenge when you, when you develop R&D? I mean, you know, and, and change the focus of a company to look at R&D. A lot of Indian companies are doing it now. What, what are the challenges that you face and what are the learnings from that? Before I talk about challenges, let me just uh, talk about what allowed it to happen. Okay. And there are many challenges and we can talk about that for a long time. But what allowed it to happen was not having a legacy mm. of this is how it is done. And therefore, we must do it this way. So everything that we did in the Scorpio days was inventing ourselves what is the next step. We didn't have a book to follow, right? Mm -hmm. So one might say that, that not having a book to follow is a disadvantage because we don't have processes and systems. On the other hand, it's an advantage because we, don't, we are not bound by something that somebody had written in a book 10 years ago. Mm 
Okay. Uh, and that's what allowed us to do what we did. Uh, this famous story going around uh, that we had talked about at that time also that one large uh, US company uh, where the CEO understood what we're trying to do, uh, wanted to help us in engineering, but told us not told their team not to interfere with the way we're working because if we work their way, uh, then we will not be able to innovate. Right? So, so it is it is that freedom that we had and lack of uh, sort of past legacy, mm. uh, which helped us to invent ourselves. The challenges were that we had nothing. Uh, when we started uh, uh, Scorpio development in 97, we had no people, no process, no infrastructure, uh, no rule books, uh, nothing. Uh, so everything was ground up. Uh, the, the conference room that we set up, the first conference room with eight people uh, to define uh, what Scopy would look like. Uh, that conference room still is there uh, in Kandivali and something that uh, I obviously have a very close attachment to. Um, where, where we had numerous meetings, numerous meetings. We used to meet uh, uh, every Saturday without fail and often uh, many times during the week also. Uh, to kind of just start out next week. It was week after week. What, what do we do next week? Right? Sure. Uh, and uh, also since in, in some sense, uh, we had nothing to lose. Uh, because, uh, uh, because what we're trying to do was build a, a, a new company, so to say, because uh, we're trying to get out of our old uh, uh, sort of uh, product that we'd inherited from our uh, license, uh, licensor uh, to creating a new set of products of our own. And if it didn't work, then we were doomed. But if we didn't do it, we were doomed. Uh, and therefore, we had nothing to lose. Uh, the, uh, and therefore, our ability to take uh, risks was very high. We took risks with uh, trusting very young people uh, in their ability to do things. We took risk in working with new suppliers uh, of, uh, of material. We took risk in working with new suppliers of equipment. Uh, we took risk in the way we set up a plant. And one can call it risk, uh, one can call it luck, but all of it sort of came together in a way that gave us a, a, a hit product and that gets talked about even today after 13 years of its launch. How has uh, the, the perception and the role of R&D changed within the sector? Because, you know, from a nice thing to do in a small corner office to the core of any company, uh, uh, you know, wanting to survive and compete and, and become a market leader, it's been a sea change. For so young professionals who are coming into R&D, engineers, what are they coming into right now? I think it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, good question. And uh, if I go back to the time that I graduated uh, from IIT Kanpur in 1975, long time ago, um, at that time, there was only one company in the auto space uh, that anybody ever talked about. Uh, which was worth going to for an R&D engineer, for an engineer who wanted to remain an engineer. Right? And that was a dream job. Uh, frankly, that was a dream job. I applied, I didn't get in. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, when, even when I came back to India in 93, the situation still was the same. Mm -hmm. There was only one company, the same company, uh, that still had any kind of R&D uh, that uh, was worth talking about uh, that uh, in the four-wheeler space. There was some in two-wheeler space. Uh, and, and from then to now, if you look at anyone who is growing in the auto industry, whether it's two-wheeler or four-wheeler now, R&D is a very integral part of it. Mm. Okay? The R&D that is being done in India is by no means a compromise R&D. Uh, we are using the same techniques that anybody uses anywhere in the world. We're using the same suppliers, same level of equipment, same delivery. So today, India being a market where every player is there any indian company also has to be able to compete with them on equal footing it cannot be that i am an indian company and therefore i'm not going to offer as much uh, customer doesn't care uh, customer would give a preference i think to an indian company provided we give the same value the same technology the same performance that comes from a multinational and therefore for able to for us to compete we have to be absolutely equal uh, so whether it is safety, whether it is emission requirement, whether it is reliability, whether it is fuel efficiency, whether it is structure, whether it is comfort, ride and handling, anything, it has to be on par. And therefore, the kind of people that we have, the kind of technology that we have, the kind of consultants that we use uh, in our in our R&D center are like any, anybody else. And therefore, for any engineer, if he wants to really enjoy engineering, and I'm saying that not because I'm an auto industry, mm. auto development is the most fascinating thing uh, to, to for an for engineer to work on but it, 
it, it's also changed dramatically, right? Now the difference between a car and the next is really about technology, about the uh, not only the design, the product, but also how technology is changing the interface. So as an engineer who worked in Detroit to now an engineer who's, you know, looking at the new phase of growth or the next leg of how automobiles are going to be, what is the what are the two, three things that are really going to drive things going forward? Well, uh, see, if I look, if I sort of become granular uh, and, uh, and go down to very specifics, um, what is driving the, the development of automobiles today are three things, okay? Regulation, customer demand, and competition, okay? Uh, and technology is in a way supporting all three. Regulation means emission safety, uh, mostly. Okay. Customer demand means comfort, performance, design that is styling. And competition means new technology coming in uh, by players from all around the world, uh, which, is, which is coming into India also, obviously. And an Indian company, whether it's Mahindra or anybody else for that matter, has to make sure that on these three axes, uh, regulation, of course, has to be met. There's no ifs and buts about it, but other two also. Uh, we are uh, as good as anybody else. And therefore, when an automobile engineer comes into India, and one advantage, uh, I must say, that that a fresh engineer has in India is that you are thrown into the pond as soon as you come in. Mm. There's no question of uh, 17 people with gray hair there to hold your hand and help you because everybody is young. Uh, and therefore, you get to do uh, things that... Uh, Often in a MNC, you may take years uh, before you get to do that uh, because of their vast uh, pool of trained, experienced engineers uh, versus our uh, very young team. Uh, and the average age of all our uh, teams have al always remained 27. Really? So Scorpio was 27, uh, Dilo was 27, uh, XUV was 27, and even today, uh, when we talk about uh, it, it's 27 has become 28, but not 35. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is that at a very young age, at, at the entry level, engineers to start the, get the opportunity to work on key projects, uh, key technologies, and really make a difference. Uh, not not remain trainees for five years. Uh, in the very first year, they are really making a difference, and that's that's exciting. I mean, today's engineer, unlike uh, when I was a young engineer, don't want to wait so many years uh, to start making a difference. They want they say, "I'm ready. I have gone through my four years of college. I've done six months of training." Now tell me what I can do and don't tell me that I need to learn for four more years. Right. You're the chairman of the board that looks at IIT Chennai, one of the most, uh, you know, uh, coveted engineering colleges in the country. What is your uh, advice to the faculty, uh, you know, the students? Because one of the big issues has been the connect between academia and industry. How do you see that bridging and what uh, what do you see when you look at uh, IIT Chennai, for instance? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, deep question uh, and, uh, and not something that I just want to give a glib answer to. Um, uh, first of all, I must say that uh, this uh, opportunity that I was given to be the chairman of the board of Gurna IIT Madras uh, was something that uh, uh, now I'm finding to be very, very exciting for me. Very interesting because when I see how IITs work, I didn't have any connect with education uh, in the last several years. So see how IITs work, what are the difficulties that they face. Uh, I am beginning to see the other side uh, of, uh, of uh, the fence to see what we need to do. What is needed today uh, uh, in, in one sentence is a much better interaction between academia and India and, and, and industry today in India. Okay. The talent that is available with faculty, uh, not just in IIT Madras, but now I'm coming in contact with many faculty members uh, across uh, the top institutions. I'm, I can only talk about that. The talent that is available here in faculty to do both fundamental research, but more so applied research that industry can use immediately is very high, very high, uh, and comparable to any comparable, I think, to anywhere else. But the opportunities that they're getting is very low. Okay, the kind of research funding that we have today in IITs, even and IIT probably gets uh, a bigger piece of the pie, uh, is dismal uh, for IIT Madras with a faculty strength of about eight hundred. The total research funding is about 300 crores. Okay, that is 25, 30 lakh per faculty member. That is very small. We need to find ways and means of increasing that. And that cannot come from the government of India. That has to come from the industry. I don't think we should look to the government mm -hmm. uh, to fund research. Uh, we have to look to the industry to fund research in IITs. And not because it's a good thing to do, but because it is something that will add value. And I do believe that if uh, there is a proper uh, interaction that happens, a little bit of 
understanding on both sides what the needs are, the industry side and academia side, then I think uh, Indian industry will benefit a lot. And it's not an instant return. So if somebody is looking to see what will happen in three months, sorry, nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking to see what can happen in three years, a lot can happen. And therefore, I think if industry works very closely with uh, IITs and NITs, a uh, lot can happen uh, in terms of helping the institute to strengthen their ability to produce good research and good students who will go out and make a difference and for the industry to be able to do, uh, to be able to get access to very high caliber of, uh, of uh, researchers, okay, that's on the research side. On the academic side, um, today also the caliber of people who go into IITs uh, has not dropped by any means uh, from the time uh, of 1975 or 1970 when I went to IIT, oh my goodness, okay. Um, but what has changed is uh, the number of opportunities there are compared to what it used to be at that time and therefore many of the students don't want to make the career in engineering. Mm. Uh, and many students after IITs want to go into uh, do MBA and go into say management or even uh, go into various fields, investment banking, IT, so on and so forth, which is fine. I mean, uh, of course, we cannot say that that should not happen and that is a uh, given good career opportunity, therefore it should happen. But what is uh, perhaps missing is that students don't realize the opportunities available in manufacturing and industry uh, for applying their knowledge, uh, for having fun doing it, it's not all drudgery, uh, for having fun doing it, and also earning potential. Uh, so, it's not that uh, manufacturing industry does not pay well. Uh, in fact, if you were to compare uh, the compensation of R&D engineers, um, it's by no means a compromise. Uh, they're, they're very well paid uh, uh, today. Uh, and, 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 but perhaps somehow that recognition is not there. Sure. Uh, uh, so, where I would like to start with is before we talk about compensation career, what do you do if you as a graduate go to an industry? What are the opportunities available to you? And there still is an old mindset that nothing much happens, uh, you know, we will not do anything meaningful, we'll be one generation behind technology. None of that is true, no matter which industry you are in. Because India is a global marketplace. And when you're a global marketplace with global companies here, no matter which industry you are in, you have to be current. You have to be up to mark in terms of technology that you offer in your product, whether you are in FMCG or whether you are in automotive or whether you are uh, in in some that some industry making uh, making soap or making uh, uh, whatever it might be, so 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 uh, I think if we can encourage that, if we can have better understanding of what an industry has to offer for top uh, uh, engineering colleges, we'll attract more and more bright minds into uh, industry into manufacturing, and that'll that'll serve well because we have very talented uh, students. You know, when you talk about engineering, there is the IITs and the big institutes, and then there are the many. In Mumbai itself, we have 67 engineering colleges. I mean, these are youngsters who are going to these colleges who want, who are thirsting for an education. What needs to be done to get them up to speed? Dr. Goenka, are they up to speed? What more can be done and how can you get far more practical knowledge and training over there? See, uh, I would, I would uh, say that uh, sometimes we underestimate the kind of talent uh, that is available in these uh, uh, sort of this, the, the next level engineering institutions. Uh, more often than not, uh, the students there perhaps come from uh, uh, a background where they have not had an opportunity to showcase their personality. Mm -hmm. and, and personality also makes a difference in how you see a person. But many of our very good engineers mm -hmm. uh, have come from unknown colleges uh, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and some of our vice president level engineers have come, come not from IITs and NITs but from uh, local colleges, government colleges uh, and that we have. Uh, however, what is lacking uh, very clearly uh, is that uh, the infrastructure available in these colleges uh, mm -hmm. for laboratories, for classrooms, uh, even sometimes for textbooks uh, affordability wise. Uh, is, is, is not competitive. Uh, how do we support these colleges uh, in, in, in a sense that these students get the same opportunity at least uh, as one will get in IIT or NITs? And the faculty members, uh, how do we ensure that, uh, that good faculty members are willing to come and teach uh, in these colleges? 
Now, I don't think that we should pretend that these colleges should become uh, research-oriented colleges. IITs and NITs are research-oriented and they should remain that way. Uh, I think these colleges should focus on teaching. These colleges should focus on producing very good engineers, uh, very practical engineers who will come in and do a lot of work in both R&D and manufacturing uh, for, for, for top companies in India that do not have to go into sort of medium or small scale only. Uh, and they can do it. And they can do it. Maybe we have to work a little harder with them. When they come in, maybe, maybe we have to work a little harder with them. But uh, raw talent is there. Uh, so, so perhaps what we get is not as well cooked as we might get from IITs or NITs. But the talent is there, we just have to work a little harder. You know, uh, since this is a program for uh, online education and, you know, a lot of the engineering and ma management education, the attempt is to see how technology and online and digital can make a difference. What do you think it can do? Because suddenly, you know, you can democratize a lot of the education. You can connect the best faculty to the students. So, how do you see the role of digital uh, in this? Uh? Well, online education is getting a lot of attention these days, as you know, uh, a MOOC program that Government of India is supporting in a big way. Uh, all the, even IITs and IITs are creating uh, MOOC courses uh, for online education. Uh, it is a good opportunity. It's a good opportunity because you can connect with the best of faculty members and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what may be missing, and I'm not really, uh, I have not looked at these online courses uh, personally to see uh, what is the difference between them. What may be missing is the opportunity for that one-to-one -one interaction, the, the, the physical interaction. Sometimes that might make a difference. Not everybody perhaps can feel as comfortable sitting in front of a computer screen and watching it for about an hour uh, rather than sitting in a classroom with other students around you. And that, that environment does make a difference. Uh, but in terms of practicality, practicality and the online digital education uh, is a very good thing to happen because it does make the availability uh, possible of uh, high-end education to many people uh, and uh, perhaps reduces the cost of education also because you're able to leverage uh, a, a lecture uh, for, for a lot many more people. And that's important. That's important. The cost of education is, is high. Uh, though it's today it is uh, uh, very greatly subsidized by government of India, but I don't know if that can last forever. As more and more people want to go into higher education, uh, 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 perhaps uh, there, there is a need for it. So I think, I think uh, if I was to project, uh, I would see digital uh, education play a very important role uh, in, uh, in developing a person, and per especially when it comes to uh, post-degree uh, training. Uh, that that uh, uh, organizations like us, ours have to provide. Uh, for us, uh, providing classroom training is very expensive. So give us a sense of that. What is the continuous learning that an engineer should go through, for instance? And where can digital really play a role? Because I think continuous learning is essential, especially in a company like yours, putting people through the paces in terms of management studies, etc., as they go senior in, in leadership roles. How, how are you dealing with it and what can digital do? So, uh, every, every large organization, every good organization will have a very well laid out program uh, for development of people, uh, development both on the functional side, that is technical side, and on the sort of managerial behavior side. Uh, and, and we have also a very strong program uh, where we have clearly defined uh, uh, sort of templates that when you join the company as an engineer, this is what you will do uh, over the next several years uh, on, on both sides. Uh, what we tend to do in Mahindra more so since we are large in size, we tend to have most of the programs in-house. That means we don't send our people out for uh, for genetic programs as much as small organizations might do because we think that by doing so, we're able to sort of uh, structure the program to suit the need that we have in, uh, in, in our company for the kind of work that we do. Uh, but the learning is sort of happens uh, in three parts. One is the classroom training, okay, where we would assign a person to go and attend a course for three days or five days or seven days. But that's a very small part of learning. That's not where the major learning comes from. The major learning comes from uh, the, the, the project assignment uh, that we, we do, uh, where we try and see if it is possible for us to take you out of what you do as a normal thing and assign a different project for you and do it from the, from the view of giving you learning. Mm. In MRV, which is where R&D Center is, we have invested uh, upwards of 30 crores to set up what we are calling Mahindra Technical Academy. Mm. Uh, and it is a, a large building where we have classrooms, where we have labs, 
So you will look like you walked into a university and we have experts who come in and teach, our own people come in and teach. So the young engineers who come in uh, uh, for as GET, Graduate Engineer Training, goes through a lot of learning uh, sure. in that in the Mahindra Technical Academy. And it is also used for continuous learning. Uh, so then we bring back uh, uh, people and make give them uh, very, very sort of focused exposure, let's say designing trims uh, in a car. And we will teach you how to design trim for a whole week. Uh, so so uh, we, we have a lot of such intervention that we do. Uh, and it's a very important part uh, because of uh, how fast the technology is changing. Now, one looks at a car and says, mm, car is same, it's still four wheels, one is steering, four doors or two doors, uh, nothing has changed, but a lot has changed. If you go inside a car, and the car of today is nothing like car of 15, 20 years ago. Right? Uh, but one thing that I just want to say is that learning is something where the learner has to have the quest for learning. It's not something that can be forced upon you. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's not something that will happen because you won't get promoted if you don't learn. Okay? Uh, then the learning will not be effective. The only way the learning can be effective is that if you have the quest for learning. And sometimes I get a little bit uh, concerned uh, that there is a feeling among youngsters that I know it all. Okay? Yes, uh, I have a lot of respect for youngsters. I think their the ability to grasp uh, their overall general knowledge, uh, their ability to multitask is much, much better than what I remember when I was there is. But I think uh, the feeling that I know it all uh, should not be there. Mm. Uh, there's a lot to learn. Uh, there's nobody, nobody who knows it all. Especially also when things are changing so fast, you have to keep exactly. updated. Exactly. So you think that continuous learning is something that needs to be ingrained with the quest of learning through your career? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Two last questions and coming back to you. Because often management lessons come from successes and failures. I'm going to ask you, what is a management lesson that you have learned from a failure? Always a difficult question to answer, but uh, uh, some things I cannot talk about and some things I can talk about. Uh, uh, I think the biggest lesson that I have learned, and I'm a little bit thinking on my feet, um, is that you have to have courage of conviction. Okay, and uh, often there have been instances where I knew in my heart that this is how I should do it, but then I backed off for some reason or other, right? And then find two years later that I wish I had done it that way. So, courage of conviction is very important. When we think of a new product to be launched or new segment to be created, nobody knows what's right or wrong. Nobody knows if it's going to work or not, right? But if you have, don't have the courage, then you'll always keep doing incremental things and never take the biggest step. The biggest step will always require the courage of conviction. So my biggest uh, learning is that you have to know enough to have confidence that what I think is right will turn out to be right. And that won't happen if you don't know enough. So you, you have to learn enough, you have to know enough, you have to uh, rely on data, information, consultation, but in the end, as a senior leader in any organization, you have to connect the dots. And if you cannot connect the dots properly, you cannot be effective. So, so if somebody asks me what does a CEO do, my one sentence respond, response is that all that a good CEO does is connect the dots. Because they're experts for everything. There's an expert for marketing, there's an expert for selling, there's an expert for R&D, there's an expert for manufacturing, for buying, finance, HR. CEO only connects the dots. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my, my, my big learn. What is the proudest moment for you? I think as a career uh, will, happen to be, will have to be Scorpio. Uh, uh, will have to be Scorpio uh, because uh, it was a transition for me personally. It was a transition for the organization. Uh, and it was a transition to some extent, uh, uh, though it may sound uh, too big a thing for me to say, but in, to some extent transition for how the Indian auto industry uh, views itself in some sense, in, in, in a very, very, very uh, indirect sense. Mm. Uh, and what, what I uh, liked about it the most, uh, other than the tangible results that it gave us, was that, uh, that the can-do attitude, uh, uh, the, the, the courage that we can take on things that are very risky, that we've never done before and still succeed against the uh, best of people. And that kind of, in a way, changed our whole approach uh, to the way we do business, no matter which vertical we are in. And that's the reason I consider that to be my proudest moment. Of course, I'm 
I cannot take uh, credit for what happened. Uh, there's a whole team that was working on it. Uh, uh, there's a management support that we had from my boss at that time, Mr. Alan Durant, and of course, Anand Mahindra and the whole board. But to me personally, that would be the proudest moment. Last question, what's your message for you, a young engineer watching this? If you want to do well, and first of all, one should define what doing well is. Okay, Doing well is not just about what my title is and what my compensation is. Doing well is, have I felt end of the day that I've made a difference? And if you've not made a difference, you've not done well. So, so I come back to the message that I want to give is that first you must understand what will make you feel that you have achieved something and define that. Don't just say that it'll happen. Okay, define that. Sit down and define that. It can be a different thing with different people, doesn't matter. But define what will make you feel good that you achieved something in life. And whatever you do, do with passion. Don't do it for any other reason. If you don't have passion for it, don't do it. Don't let anybody force you to do something that you don't want to do.